After my interview with Paul Thomas Anderson about the creation of Liquors, people have been asking me nonstop to review the live-action Resident Evil films. And, to be honest, it's really something I haven't been looking forward to doing, mainly because these films have been reviewed to death, and there really isn't anything new to discuss about them. Or, at least that's what I thought, until I remembered seeing Resident Evil Genesis, a film novelization based on the movie. I remember laughing at the sight of it. <laughs> Could you imagine being an aspiring author, thinking this gig was your big break? You've been hired to adapt a movie, only to find out you'd actually be polishing Paul Anderson's turd. Adapting some hack's mediocre adaptation of a video game that already had a novel. But thankfully, Keith, R.A., DeCandido, wasn't above the task, and now we have something new to review, providing new insight to the Resident Evil cinematic universe. So, Mr. T-Virus and I will be reviewing Resident Evil Genesis, the terrifying prequel to Resident Evil Apocalypse. A prequel? Yeah, that's what it says. Interesting choice by Paul to start his series off with a prequel. Already learning something new from these books. So, should we start with Apocalypse? Nah, I've already read this book. We'll work our way chronologically and review all five books. Five? Aren't there six films? Yeah, but they conveniently forgot to write the novel based on Afterlife. A movie so blatantly stupid and baffling, I don't blame them for ignoring it. Though, it is the best worst film in the series. I'd give anything to see an author try and make sense of this nonsense. I want to know how exactly 400 Alice's traveled from Utah to Tokyo during the zombie apocalypse. How did they journey across the Pacific? Did they form relationships? And most importantly, did they les out? Would that be incest or masturbation? I don't care, but I know it'd be a hell of a lot more interesting than what Paul gave us, and that's the problem with this films. The off-screen events sound way more interesting and entertaining. I want to see the fall of civilization, the fallout of Raccoon, the battle on Washington with Wesker. It was supposed to be humanity's last stand, and Paul completely leaves out the money shot. Also, what happened to Leon, Wang, and Jill, and that deaf girl? Why go through all the trouble to save Alice, only to try and kill her? One minute she has her powers, the next Wesker's like, Psych, I didn't really give you your powers back. He pretended to give you your powers back. These movies play out like a couple of kids playing with their imagination. One kid is always making up abilities, abilities that trump the other kids, while other kids refuse to die or stay dead. You can't kill me. I can't die. And the story just keeps going until everyone's too tired to keep it up. I'm coming for you. Good luck with that. So, I'm curious to see how these authors try and fix the non-existent character motivations, plot holes, and inconsistencies. And, usually when a film series comes with a required reading to fully understand character motivations, I just cancel Disney+. Plus. But, this is a Resident Evil, and Mr. T-Virus and I have a job to do. So let's begin. <coughs> the book opens up with some boring-ass meeting between Matthew Addison and Aaron Versella. Versailles, Versailles, however you pronounce his name, A. A. Ron. He's some rich guy with a grudge against Umbrella, and he's looking for someone to infiltrate the corporation to help take them down from within. But Matthew, Marcus, Zara, Dora, and Ripley can't do it for some reason. And Matt can't do it because he's an ex-federal marshal, and that shit shows up on background checks. So, Matt suggests using his sister, Lisa Broward. Yeah. For this book, the author has changed her name from Addison to Broward. And Lisa is some recently divorced hot shit computer programmer from New York. She's not a doctor anymore. Seriously, whose word do we take as canon now? Keith or Paul? Paul can't seem to remember what happens from one film to the next, so I'm going with Keith on this. Now, I've never thought of the logistics of how Lisa successfully infiltrated the Hive, because really, who cares? But I gotta admit, I was impressed with how Keith delivered a grounded and believable scenario for her getting the job and how she went about stealing information from Umbrella. But that's about it for all the praise I'll give Keith. The rest of this book can go f itself, but more on that later. Lisa was able to get the job at the Hive because it turns out Umbrella had approached her six years earlier for the position, but she was too busy dealing with a dying mother-in-law in New York to make the transfer. But one dead mother-in-law, a divorce, and a call from Matt, and she was ready to go crawling back to Umbrella. And Umbrella was like, yep, this dead mother divorce story checks out. So they gave her the job, head of Hive IT security, and they didn't even bother to look at her ex-federal marshal philanthropist brother, or the fact that her good friend and co-worker from Citibank was murdered by Umbrella, and that his family was paid hush money to keep quiet. That dead friend was 
Mahmud Momad. Mahmud. That dead friend was Mahmud Al Rashin. You'll notice every made up character has the most foreignery name imaginable. Was this Keith's doing, or do publishers push for diversity? Anyway, back to Lisa. Lisa was the only student at MIT to pass Dr. Barr's class with an A. Barr was the dude responsible for designing the Red Queen's AI. And this is why Umbrella was headhunting Lisa for the position. So, she gets to work immediately. She forces everyone in the hive to change their passwords every eight days, hoping people will forget and she'll have to help them log in allowing her to see whatever classified information was left up on screen. And this is where Ass Kicking Alice comes in. Emphasis on comes. Alice Abernathy. Yep, that's her last name according to Keith. At least it's not Nain on a jaw or something like that. Alice, along with her fake husband Percival, are in charge of Hive security. Yeah, Spence is his middle name now. Together, Alice and Percival have so much sex, it's all they can think about whenever they think about each other. But in between all the f***ing, Alice actually does her job. She notices that Lisa's face lights up every time she helps anyone log in. So Alice tests Lisa and pretends she's forgotten her password, allowing Lisa to catch a glimpse of the liquor on her monitor. And just like in the movie and games, the creature is never officially named. I was really hoping Keith would make up some bullshit and give us a fake umbrella code name or experiment number, but nope. And it's pretty obvious Keith didn't even watch the film. He describes the liquor as a cross between human and a rhino. It's plated with horns and has a snake for a tongue. What about the liquor's genitals? Nothing. What? Yeah, I was hoping with all the sex and perversion Keith was cramming into the story, he'd at least touch on the liquor's genitals. Return this book now! I'm about to burn this book. So, with the confirmation that Lisa was indeed a spy, Alice asks her out to dinner. And this is where the book gets unbearably bad. It was already bad, but I cannot forgive Keith for this. The next 10 pages are all about how New York cuisine is better than raccoon cuisine. Lisa and Alice turn out to be food snobs, and Alice takes her to her favorite restaurant, Che Bono. And to make things worse, they order dessert for like two more pages. Cancel this date. Look, Keith, I'm sure you're above Resident Evil and you were meant to do better things, but the people who pick up this book aren't interested in Keith D. Candido's stories of sex, food, and terrorism. Just stick to the script. If you have to pad anything, pad it with zombies in action. Not f***ing tales of ordering Tartufo. The book is only 280 pages and the events of the movie don't even start until over halfway. We don't even hear about a zombie until page 181. <sighs> Sorry. So, nothing of value was discussed at dinner, or dessert, or on the drive back to the mansion. But, after being dropped off outside the mansion, Alice finally confronts Lisa and says, I can help you get the virus. I have access to security codes, surveillance plans, the works. And over the course of five weeks, Alice and Lisa keep on having secret meetings right outside their mansion, and Percival begins to take notice, because these secret meetings are cutting into his sex time with Alice. Also, his insecuriosity gets the better of him, so he busts out a directional microphone to listen in, hoping to just hear two women discussing their periods and not the size of his wiener. He overhears their plan to steal the T-Virus, and this sets everything in motion for the apocalypse. Now, for some BS reason, Alice can't risk stealing the T-Virus herself, even though she has I have access to security codes, surveillance plans, the works. And she's head of Hive Security. It would be totally acceptable for her to be in a restricted area, more so than the new hire Lisa. But instead, the girls get nothing done, and Percival just walks in and steals it. You know, because he's head of Hive Security, it isn't a cause for concern for him to be down there. Damn, that was easy. Yeah, no ID badge, no facial recognition required. Apparently you just need a hazmat suit and the right passcodes, and the Red Queen won't even bat an eye. The trickiest part would be operating the Waldos, the what? The wacky mechanical arm things. Yeah, wasn't expecting to learn anything new from a cheap cash grab book like Resident Evil, but here we are, Waldos. Seriously, did anyone else know that these things had a name? Anyway, before we continue, there are a few things that have always bothered me about this opening scene. Why does Spence, I mean Percival, toss this vial? If it's really worth billions, why waste hundreds of millions? 
It's not like he's covering up his tracks. He takes the hazmat suit off immediately. You're telling me the security footage didn't catch his face going in and out of the change room? The Red Queen should notice this leak immediately, either from visual confirmation or the air sensors, which should have locked the hive down in seconds. But according to this book, the Red Queen takes five minutes to lock down. And Percival knows this because it's his job. Fine, I accept that, I guess. Maybe for a real evacuation where she'd give people time to escape, but this is a quarantine. Also, there would be remote access to the hive to safely investigate the leak. The morons wouldn't open it up after 25 minutes after lockdown. The events of the movie shouldn't and wouldn't happen in the real world. Percival would have been busted by the security footage review, which should have been the first thing they investigate. But the team does get sent in, and they never even bother to ask what happened down here, which is kind of the point of their whole mission. And if Spence, fuck it, we're calling him Spence, only has five minutes to escape the lockdown, why is he wasting time disconnecting the train's power? And don't even get me started on this choo-choo train. There are 523 employees working in the hive every two weeks. In rotation, the workers get a two-day break on the surface, meaning this train should be moving groups of people every day, interrupting all the sex on the surface. But this train has no seats, no handrails. Instead, it has dangerous-ass pipes hanging loosely from the ceiling over a floor that could drop out at any moment if someone accidentally leans up against this button. It's no wonder Maumad El Ration died. And, for some reason, the Red Queen blows her lethal load of gas underground, but doesn't feel like killing Alice or Spence. How convenient. And this is where the book finally meets the movie, where we get to know these throwaway characters a little too well. For instance, did you know it was this guy's first day on the job, and he likes his coffee without a lid? because it's too hot, or that his name was Mark Torvaldson, and he has three best friends who are all unemployed, Vince Markinson, Eleanor Wu, and Jack Anacheri Rico. They call themselves the Awesome Foursome, and they get together every month for bad movie nights, and Mark's uncle died in a crash, and his sister, what in the f Right? F***ing get on with it, Keith. Seriously, and you'll be glad to know that this lady, finally gets a real name besides Mrs. Black Lady. Thanks, Keith, for undoing Paul's blatant racism and making her more than just the color of her skin. The only black person in the hive, and she's gotta be called Mrs. Black. What's this guy's name? Mr. Yellow? Dude, not cool. What? No. I mean because he has yellow hair. Um, why don't we just defer no to case. Mr. Um, Mr. Brown. Ah, oh, all right. Okay, first test. I will not call you that. Anyway, Mrs. Black is now known as Ella Fontaine. She acknowledges Mark's existence, and this turns him on. And at the same time, Simon and Garfunkel's Sound of Silence plays inside the elevator. What is that? Why, you ask? I don't know, maybe because Screen Gems can afford it now. We also learn they're only on the third floor, so I don't know what all the fuss was about. Ella loses her head while Mark spends his final moments wondering what it would have been like to have hooked up with a black lady, despite having the lower half of a black lady all to himself. Some people are just never satisfied. Yeah, and you'd think he'd like his women like he likes his coffee, without a lid and spilt all over him. <laughs> now, in the lab where the virus leaked, Dr. Green is now Anna Bolt, named after the actress Anna Bolt who played Dr. Green. What? Yeah, this is the only unnamed character to be named after themselves. No idea why. And, and there's my yogurt. sister coming up again. Well done, Anna. Oh, look at- He could have done this for Commando 1, Commando 2, but nope, they get made up names like Vance Drew and Alfonso Warner. Sorry, Commandos. Paul was just too lazy to care about your careers. Just think of how things could have been different if Commando 2 had been given a real name. Maybe Mark Logan Black would still be married and have an acting career that went past 2002. Update. While editing this video, I discovered that the Red Queen identifies Dr. Green as Anna Bolt, which raises new questions. If Keith can read this fine print on screen, why did he get Lisa's name wrong? And how'd he botch the liquor description? It's not like he adapted this off a screenplay. This novel was written a whole two years after the release of this film. So that was Anna Bolt. And this guy is Mo. Mo cannot stop thinking about how amazing Anna is in bed. So he asks her to come over again, and she says, Maybe I won't show this time. Why not? Because I'm busy. 
and Anna hates him because he's a simpleton who's obsessed with Britney Spears, which doesn't add up at all. Raccoon City was nuked on October 1st, 1998, and Britney Spears didn't exist until September 28th, 1998. Plus, I read ahead and learned that the events of Apocalypse don't start until one month after the Hive incident, pushing this further back into 1998 making Mo a real creeper who likes Disney kids, cause that's the only way to explain it. Oh yeah, and another timeline inconsistency in this book, they make a joke about 9-11 a whole three years before Keith had anything to do with it. So, this lab starts flooding and Johnny Wayne Carlson grabs a fire ax to break the windows, but they all know this is plasti glass, some indestructible glass that Umbrella had invented. It can withstand most anything you throw at it, besides dogs of course. Now, Anna's final moments, much like everyone else's in this book, are spent thinking about how great sex was with her coworker. While at the same time, trying not to sound like a complete hoe, she's thankful she wore this bra to the wet t-shirt contest and not something lacy. Lisa panics thinking she's just been made. Today was the day she was supposed to steal the T-virus. She had just got done emailing Matt detailed plans and arranging a meeting when the lockdown happened. And to hide her message, she attached a text doc file to Matt's email and then thousands of gibberish text files to everyone else she spammed. To bury the one important message, she was already planning on saying that she was hacked when she realized the alarms weren't for her. And her final words were, I'm sorry. Now, with everyone in the hive in either deep sleep or deep death, we're introduced to a new character, Major Kane or as this book likes to call him, Major Timothy Abel Kane. He's this dude from Apocalypse, and he gives the orders to assemble the sanitation squad. And, as usual, Keith loves to waste our time telling us about every character's life story, as if we care. Supposedly, Kane is some military badass who anyone would follow into battle, but, like, just look at him. Also, he killed his sister Mary's husband for cheating on her, his brother Anthony was a crackhead who jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge, and his other brother, Michael Kane, is the head of Umbrella Security in Chicago. And absolutely none of this information matters, but what else are you here for? One calls up Bartholomew James Kaplan, the team's tech guy, former FBI. Together they assemble the team, starting with Rain Melendez. Not sure where she got the name Ocampo, but Keith is saying it's Melendez. She's ex-LAPD and a SWAT reject. She was originally a diversity hire for stockholder benefits, who later proved herself, though she never proves herself to us. Blow me. Next we have Olga Danilova, the medic, ex-Russian army, followed by Vance Drew, Commando One, he's ex-NYPD, and then we have Alfonso Warner, Commando Two, recruited from Raccoon Penitentiary, and J.D. Hawkins, ex-Navy SEAL by way of CIA. And then there's the last, and certainly least, we have the guy who calls himself One, a nickname he gave himself. He's supposed to be some kind of badass motherfucker killer, but he doesn't come off like that. In fact, all these people look and act like it's their first day out on the field. If you want me to believe these are cold-blooded murderers for hire, then don't have them cry over dead friends and coddling grown men over missing fingers. My girlfriend's had fingers cut off, and she did less crying than this. And it wasn't done by a laser to cauterize the wound. And especially don't have them approaching bloody strangers in a situation where it's unclear who the enemy is, or taking their masks off in a biohazard. If your friends had been a little more thorough, they would have seen right through my false ID. and all the red flags would have gone off. So, the team heads out to the mansion, 25 minutes after the leak, and this is where the book finally meets the story of the movie. Over halfway through, and we finally get to Alice waking up naked from some wet dream. And she now has amnesia from the sleeping gas. And personally, I think this is a terrible decision to structure the story like this. The reader is no longer on this fish out of water ride with Alice. We know everything there is to know, there are no more surprises or shocking revelations. It's just Alice not remembering things, things we already know the answer to. And from here on, Keith doesn't really deliver anything new to the story. Alice can remember her mother's maiden name, Ferreira, and things like CVS, though she has no idea who she is. She doesn't know what to call a robe, but she knows what panties are. And yes, she puts them on. Also, I was hoping the book would tell us the story behind this scar, but she doesn't remember. But I'll give you a clue. We learn all about it in the next book, 
so subscribe to this channel and get notified for the Apocalypse book review. So let's get going. Matt shows up, the team busts in. Matt claims he's a new recruit for the RCPD, which everyone knows the RCPD doesn't respond to calls out here because the mansion isn't located in Raccoon City. It's located in Foxwood Heights. So the team thinks he's being pranked by the precinct and they buy his story about not being in the system yet. And they expect us to believe these guys are professionals. One is supposed to be so scary and intimidating that no one would ever dare talk back to him. And even Alice is supposed to be the worst of the worst, but here she is crying over some stranger she's only known for two hours. And then here she is again, crying two minutes later, having a complete breakdown. One is so skittish and on high alert, you'd think he was the rookie. The only glimpse of badassery we get is when one stands in the middle of the hall and accepts his death like a moron. The dude has like five feet of room behind him and he just gives up. Oh, and let's talk about this laser hall. According to the book, Kaplan knew about these lasers, but he didn't think they were operational yet. Also, it was totally Alice who got the team killed here. If she hadn't asked about taking out the Red Queen right in front of the Red Queen, then maybe the Red Queen wouldn't have diced everybody up. The amateurs. Now, in the Queen's chamber, Spence learns he can roll a quarter through his fingers, and I was surprised to find Spence is actually playing with a quarter here in the background of the scene. Nice catch, Keith. Now, if only you had bothered to actually look at the liquor. In the dining hall, Rain forces Matt to sit on this box, though it's still never explained who helped him up. I just threw him up there. You know? I said, here, sit. And it's here, Rain notices all the liquor containers switch from stable to unstable, but she doesn't feel the need to share this information with anyone else. Instead, she just picks her fingernail with a knife. Keith calls this a 357 Magnum, but then calls this a Beretta. Matt schools us on coagulated blood and the history of zombies and comic books. In the 1950s, due to some comic book code, it was illegal to call the undead zombies. Instead, they called them Zuvembies. Then, in all the confusion, Alice keeps the conversation going with Matt, updating him on all the people she got sliced up. While the rest of the team around them are being eaten by zombies, Alice doesn't remember she can kick ass yet, so she just leaves with Matt. And no clue on how they magically get separated from the team, the team that's screaming and shooting non-stop, but somehow they pull it off. Spence, on the other hand, notices that the only safe exit is back to the Queen's chamber, so the team falls back, and it's at this moment when Rain says, fuckity fuck fuck fuck, and I kinda wish that made it into the movie. And I wish all the fucking made it into the movie. I think we all do. Anyway, Alice loses Matt and just wanders off some more until she reaches the dog kennels where she bumps into her buddy Clarence White and all her training comes rushing back to her. We finally get to see ass kicking Alice in action and I gotta say, this was better done on paper. I don't know why, but it doesn't come off as stupid as it looks. Alice takes out Clarence and then all eight puppies with just 16 bullets and a jump kick, which is kind of inefficient, but I'm not one to talk. It took me a whole clip and two kicks to put my own dog down. But back to Matt, who wasn't knocked out by the Red Queen. He remembers the directions Lisa gave him to find her desk. Not sure why she risked sharing this information. It's not like he was ever gonna come down here and meet her. And of all the things that need explaining, how Matt found Lisa's desk is not at the top of the list. Just having him randomly stumble into Lisa is more believable. Anyway, Alice shows up and kills Lisa with an Alice in Wonderland paperweight. Alice recognizes Lisa and starts to question if she was the contact who had betrayed Lisa. But we as the reader do not care. Back at the Queen's chamber, Alice and Matt just magically run past a horde of zombies again. And speaking of magic, Rain's 357 is now a 1911 for some reason. She also notes that she has one magazine left for her MP5K and I'm not sure what happens to all this ammo because they never use it again in the book. So in the Queen's Chamber, Rain has some extra dialogue with the Red Queen about how all this mess came about from an anti-wrinkle cream and that the quarantine was going perfectly fine until the sanitation team showed up. 25 minutes later, the Queen then leads them down a maintenance hatch, which is password locked. And I guess only the Queen's Chamber's maintenance hatches are locked because we all know JD didn't know the passcodes. Seriously, how did these zombies get in the maintenance tunnel? So Rain gets bit some more and cries about it. Next we have Kaplan's suicide attempt, which is actually done correctly in the book. Besides Keith fucking up the whole fish out of water amnesia approach with Alice, he does this bit right. Unlike Paul, who immediately reveals Kaplan's cowardice, which removes all tension from the next scene, 
because the viewer knows he's still out there to help. So they leave Kaplan for dead, and Alice remembers this bunny's name is Daffy, and then she remembers there's an antivirus. All of this new information triggers Spence's memory and reveals what we've known all along. You just couldn't keep not remembering, could you? So Spence takes off with the 1911 on his way to the train where the T-virus was all along, while Alice, in this water, is thankful for her thigh-high boots. Seriously, Keith? You spotted the quarter, but you can't even bother to look at the cover of your own book. These are not thigh-high boots. And next, when it comes time to murder Rain, they find a fire axe that shouldn't even be in this room. Remember Johnny Wayne Carlson? Yeah, he was the broken foot zombie dragging the axe in the dining hall. The axe that he got from this room, but whatever. So Alice breaks the monitor at the same time the system's fried. And Matt's all like, oh, that's some axe you got there. But to our surprise, it was really Kaplan. What? He's alive? Right? Like, last time we saw him, he killed himself. Like, I did not see this coming. This was a surprise. How the hell did he find them? Keith actually explains that. Kaplan can see the heat signatures on his wrist top. He watches Spence's heat signature fade out, not knowing who was dying by the liquor. And he thinks how funny it'd be if he was the only surviving member of his team, since they all used to make fun of him for not being a badass. At the platform, Alice actually decapitates Spence, while Matt rips off his shirt to impress the girls, making improvised bandages. Kaplan starts up the choo-choo train, and for the remainder of the book, the story is not told from any one character's point of view. Instead, it's just Keith stating everything as it happens. Rain dies, Kaplan dies, Liquor dies, Alice has a breakdown, and Matt starts flexing his arms for the CG wiggly worms. And this is where we finally get to meet Major Kane, and he's all like, I want him in the Nemesis program. And a little while later, Alice wakes up Nakey again, this time in Raccoon City Hospital that has a whole wing donated by Umbrella, and this time she remembers everything, including the fact that she can short these Umbrella card reader mechanisms with only a needle, something she discovered months ago and had reported to Major Kane, but thankfully he did nothing about it. And that's it. Did I forget anything? D, you left out all the sex. Yeah, but... This video is long enough as it is. If I stop to talk about every boner, every wet dream, every time a character wanted to fuck another character, did fuck, or regretted not fucking, we'd have to break this video into multiple parts. And it's best not to spoil everything. Anyway, I'm still reading the other books, so I'm gonna wait to give my overall rating of this book. I was thinking of going low on this rating, but seeing how awful the other books get, I think this one might deserve some more credit. So far it's the least racist and least absurd that I've come across, but we'll see. Subscribe or check back for part two. Also, if you enjoyed this video, check out my Patreon page to become a member of the RE Tards. And if that's not enough for you, follow me on Twitch. My channel name is Chode Veronica. Oh yeah, and shout out to my patrons. Thanks for supporting the channel. Thank you Kyle, Kiera, Marco DiMartino, E13, and Julia for supporting the channel. Thanks. Bye.